Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for watching our show today. Today is also a special show. Today, we will not answer any of your questions. We will not take any um, question today. Today, we will talk about read of mandamus. And after our presentation of read of mandamus, we, I will give you some quick update about some of the latest immigration news. So today, our uh, presenter is Caitlin Moran. Kate is a terrific uh, legal writer and legal researcher. Those who do not know that, you know, the entire legal practice, law practice centered on legal research and writing. She is great in legal research and writing. She's our law clerk. She's great in NIW kind of cases and also read up mandamas. She knows a lot about that. That's why I, um, I'm in inviting her today to discuss about read up mandamas. So let's welcome uh, Caitlin Moran to talk about read up mandamas. Kate, you please start. Thank you so much. Thank you for the compliments as well. I've been very lucky to work on a lot of writ of mandamus cases under you, so I'm very excited to talk about it. Yeah, so I'll give an overview about what the writ of mandamus is, how does it help immigration matters, and what can you expect from the standard timeline. So the writ of mandamus, it's a remedy that's codified in the Mandamus Act in the U.S. Code, and it is you are filing a lawsuit in order to get a federal district court to sign off on an order for a government official or an agency to do their job, really, or to not do something as well. Um, I have the four prongs that you have to meet, and mostly you have to prove that you have no other remedy available. A lot of times people will file these if they, um, for example, in immigration, you have a visa that's been pending for six months, and you need some somebody to make a decision on your visa. So in the immigration context, um, you can file against USCIS or the State Department um, for action on your visa. For example, I have an H-1B visa applicant that has been waiting months for a decision. A lot of times people will get the standard um, response that it's an administrative processing, or they can go to make a inquiry, have their congressman make an inquiry on their behalf, but it's really not effective as having um, a writ of mandamus lawsuit. And once you get the mandamus, um, it's something the agency has to comply with. They can't ignore the order. Um, and also you can file under the Administrative Procedure Act you can file for undue delay. Um, so anytime I've seen a writ of mandamus, you usually reference both things, the Mandamus Act and the APA. Um, and for standard timeline, first you have to, um, your attorney will write a complaint on your behalf and then they'll have to serve it to the defendants. Then they the defendants have 60 days to answer the government attorney. Hopefully in this point, um, the government attorney will just reach out to your attorney and try to get the case worked out. Um, or and they'll reach out to the appropriate agency because they don't really have the resources or time to defend every single mandamus action that they get. Um, so they'll really just want the agency to make a decision on the visa. Sometimes they might ask for extensions. You, people might have to interview again, which can be cumbersome, but it is worth it if you do get a decision. So sometimes it can take two weeks for a result. Sometimes it can take up to four months. It just depends on all the facts of the cases, really. And this is something that somebody can do for themselves, but it's such a legal process that would really benefit you to get an attorney, honestly, to help you with this process. And so you can reach out to us, of course, to schedule a consultation. I would add some uh, frequently asked questions, like a lot of uh, misconception among people about read up mandamus. So let me talk a few common, uh, like a frequent less questions. So a lot of time, so I am admitted in federal district court in DC and admitted also federal district court in Maryland. So sometime I, you know, use my judgment to either file a lawsuit in DC or in Maryland, depending on the situation. And sometime, you know, the opposing attorneys, uh, government attorneys, they try to transfer the case to some other uh, venues. And a lot of time people say, so if you knew this, this case would be, you know, transferred to some other venue, why did you file here? So, mm -hmm. and then it's kind of very hard for me to explain the venue situation because, you know, in federal rule of civil procedure, venue is a very complex topic. And a lot of time I tell my clients, please do, do not ask me that kind of question because it's, it's very hard for me to explain the entire venue thing because in law school, they teach venue for like, you know, two weeks, three weeks um, in, in a course. So I request my clients to, you know, trust your attorney because, you know, attorneys are trained to, take care of the legal matter. Venue is a very complex legal matter. Uh, any attorney, whether they file lawsuit in DC, Maryland, or some other venue, they know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. So please trust them. So venue is, it depends on many factors. A again, I'm not going to discuss those things in this uh, short presentation because you'll not understand. Like I'm, I'm talking to the client, uh, the prospective clients and to the public that you'll not understand like why I filed a lawsuit in uh, DC or I filed a lawsuit in um, you know Maryland. Sometimes I may file a lawsuit in 
Arizona or as a California, depending on uh, where the appropriate venue is. Venue is subject to many information. Also, uh, another very frequent last question is, oh, three of my other uh, friends, they, have, uh, they filed mandamus through you and their case has been approved. Why not me? Why my case is not approved? Again, each case is different. Each and every case is different. Anytime any, uh, we file a lawsuit in federal district court, uh, the court assign a judge. It depends on the judge. It depends on the uh, U.S. attorney's office, you know, who is the uh, appointed U.S. attorney. It depends on many factors. So not all cases will go in the same direction. Each case is different. And sometimes, like, uh, you know, a single, a simple, a very similar fact, but the outcome can be totally different depending on the situation. So that's why I tell my clients, read up mandamus or any kind of legal procedure. It's not binary. It's not like a one or zero, you know, yes or no. There's a lot of gray areas. There's a lot of you know, we need to act depending on the situation. Anytime anything happens, then we act accordingly. That's why it is called law practice. You know, law and medical is called practice because a lot of the decision we take depend on the instant situation. We cannot predict upfront. Some of our cases get approved before 60 days, before even, you know, um, U.S. attorney do anything or they submit any answer or anything. So some of the cases go beyond 90 days. I think the worst case scenario in our uh, law firm was like a 124 days, uh, you know, after we submit case to the court. So I request my prospective clients and also our current clients, trust your attorney and let them do the legal work. And you only tell uh, your attorney if there's any factual mistake or any factual information that you think we should be submitting, like, like your your name is spelling, your you know, spelling of your company or like a joining date, you know, how long have you been waiting for um, for this, uh, you know, uh, administrative process? Those are the factual information that that is your personal. If we do any mistake or any attorney do mistake, uh, you know, they can do that. Definitely tell your attorney. But when it comes to legal matter, please trust your attorney. Otherwise, it is a, you'll not be able to understand all those complex things. Another very um, a common question, uh, mis misunderstanding is like when we file a lawsuit in federal district court, uh, the court issues 60 days deadline for government attorneys, US attorneys to answer. And a lot of our clients and prospective clients, they misunderstand this. They think this is the 60 days by the time the government needs to process their visa or do their job. That's not true. This is just answer. Answer doesn't mean that they have to complete their work. Answer means they just need to acknowledge and they just need to submit an answer to the court saying that, yes, we received the case. This is the situation. This is like, yeah, this thing. This is another common misconception. So I'm, I'm talking, I'm giving like an overall an idea to our uh, prospective clients uh, how read up and numbers goes. Another thing is, a lot of time when we submit, you know, read of mandamus to the court, government attorneys, U.S. attorneys, they will submit a motion to dismiss. Mm -hmm. And then our client, they say, well, they submit the uh, motion to dismiss. So I don't think it, this case doesn't have any merit. Why did you submit this <laughs> court to the case to the court? And then I need to explain them just because government is submitting a motion to dismiss doesn't mean that this case doesn't have merit. It has merit, but this is their job. So this is another um, another very unique situation um, of being a lawyer. You represent your client. So me, I am your client. I will represent you. I will try my best to protect your right in every possible way, every possible legal way. At the same time, government lawyers' duty is to protect the interest of the government. Just mm -hmm. because they are saying something doesn't mean that is true. Just because I'm saying something that's not true. It is the judge who will decide who is right, who is wrong. And let's say we filed a lawsuit in federal district court in Maryland and judge said, no, you do, your case doesn't have a merit. And they dismiss the case. We can always appeal against this judgment in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And I'm also admitted there. So again, if the Fourth Circuit judges, they canceled you know, the judgment of the district court, then that judgment doesn't have any value. Then it goes to the judgment of the circuit court. Exactly. And then finally, if we go to the Supreme Court, I'm not licensed to the Supreme <laughs> Court yet. I'm going to uh, apply for my Supreme Court license very soon. But I'm saying that at the end of the day, whatever the five justices of Supreme Court, whatever they say, that's the final, mm -hmm. unless some um, extraordinary situation arises. So 
this is these are the common uh, legal situations a lot of people you don't understand and i i don't expect you to understand everything because you know you are not expert like if when i go to a doctor's office i trust my doctor because they they are trained to handle my medical condition similarly i request my clients trust your attorney if if they do any mistake you know they can always fix it and yeah finally if they do major mistake you have like a remedy for that but please do not try to understand all this thing that will uh, not help you so yeah. that was our today's uh, discussion kay do you want to add anything um, oh, yeah. Yeah. especially your uh, experience when you are drafting uh, briefs and you know uh, motions to submit yeah well i think another common misconception is that people think they'll be like punished i guess for filing these lawsuits or they're like scared to file it maybe. And I don't think anyone should be scared. Like you're not gonna be punished for using the court system to your benefit. Um, the USCIS or State Department, they're not gonna blacklist you or anything. Like if you've been waiting for a long time, you should definitely file these lawsuits. Do not be afraid to. Exactly, exactly. A lot of people ask me the same question to me. And I said, you know, America is the land of laws. So if you take the legal remedy, you are actually respecting American legal procedure and which is great. Like everybody uh, should uh, appreciate and the government, they do appreciate this thing. So, yeah, do not worry that whether your, uh, you know, um, lawsuit will, you know, harm you in future. Any, any way, the answer is no, it will not harm in any way. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you, Kate, for joining. So before we end our discussion, I would like to read, not read, like go through some of the recent um, legal news, uh, like not legal news, sorry, <laughs> immigration related news. So USCIS announces premium processing for F1 and certain STEM OPT extensions. So uh, those who are international students uh, staying in America, studying when you go for uh, OPT application after completion of your, of your degree or uh, go for a STEM OPT extension after your one year of OPT. Now there is a premium processing and also some of the applications you can submit online. So this is really great uh, improvement for USCIS because uh, you know submission of online is more environment friendly. Also, it will make it faster and premium processing will also guarantee you getting EAD card faster than before. So I think this is a good uh, move. Also, a lot of the latest update I see is about, um, you know, entrepreneur, like entrepreneur from a foreign country, how they can come to America and do their business. So my understanding is that USCIS is moving towards like a, a you know, more flexible policy for international entrepreneurs to come to America and do their business. I think this is a great thing. Uh, those entrepreneurs who are you know staying in a foreign country if you want to take advantage of american uh, business environment because it's a it's a big country it's a huge market it's like the largest market in the world so you should take advantage also um let me uh, talk a little bit about those recent um so new entrepreneur resource available on uscs website so uscs website recently updated um some of the you know policy guidelines about entrepreneur application so i'm not going that detail i'm just you know, telling that there's a new update so those who are interested please go to the uss website especially if you search like entrepreneur resource um, you will find it also um, uss provides guideline on program for international uh, the same thing uh, yeah and also another news biometric appointments so recently we saw that um, for different immigration related purposes, you need to take biometric, that means uh, giving fingerprints. And there's a huge backlog for that. So government recently introduced mobile uh, biometric service. That means like a lot of private uh, companies, they are going to participate in this process. There's a lot of people, you know, there's a debate about, you know, whether private companies should be involved in this or not. But I think USCIS is moving towards more like a private enterprises to take your biometric i'm pretty sure they, they have like a secured portal to make sure that your personal information is not breached by somebody else but that will definitely save some of our time so those are our today's discussion about latest immigration news again thank you very much kate for joining this um, pre for presenting this uh, about uh, rita pandemus and next sunday we'll come back again and um, talk about like some other topic kate do you have any uh, closing remarks to clients um, just wanted to say thank you so much for having me um, and prospective clients. I can't wait to work with you. Um, it's been wonderful working for this firm. So if you have any immigration matters, I highly recommend Raju. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everybody, for joining.